having met Roxy Bacon before, I knew she'd be a hard act to follow, and she is. Uh, but thanks so much to the ABA Commission on, the profession, on Women in the Profession for the Margaret Brent Award. I arrived in the Ninth Circuit seven years ago in a court that's been about one quarter women for some time, including three former Margaret Brent Award winners, Shirley Hofstetter, Betty Fletcher, and Mary Schroeder. So I was not a female pioneer on my court, although we certainly still don't have the representation that is uh, equal to the number of women coming out of law school these days. Since I've been on the court, I've been uh, part order, uh, author of only one case of major significance to working women, the Hibbs case, concerning the Constitutionality of Family and Medical Leave Act, which was later affirmed by the Supreme Court. But it was mostly before I came on the court that I felt myself both navigating in somewhat untested waters and actively involved in advancing the interests of women. There was law school uh, at my 30, 30th reunion. I asked various male and female class members what the percentage of women in our law school class was. This was at Bolt Hall, class of 73. The women, the, the men, uniformly and insistently said that there were about, that definitely 50% of the people in the class were women. <laughs> the women mostly said it was about 10%. In fact, it was about 20%. So I thought it was really interesting, I mean, the skewed perception uh, was that men saw even a large minority of women as complete equality, and the women apparently felt considerably more marginalized than their numbers might suggest. Then there was clerking. There were two women clerking in San Francisco in the Ninth Circuit the year I clerked for Judge Browning. Stephanie Wildman, who is here today and has been a dear friend ever since then, and I, and we were always being confused for each other even though we don't look much alike. <laughs> the very first women in law classes were taught when I was in law school, at Bolt by Herma McKay, at Stanford by Barbara Babcock, both former Margaret Brent honorees, and both of whom over the ensuing years were resources for me and for others involved in using the law to advance the interests of women. There wasn't much law at the time because the constitutional law of sex discrimination was just beginning to be developed, and the inclusion of sex discrimination in Title VII was still most often regarded as the ploy of Southern senators who had tried unsuccessfully to scuttle the bill. I think I'm going to use Roxy's um, theme here and get it to show <laughs> Or not to show <laughs> Both these nascent strains of legal doctrine proved, however, of enormous importance in the next 20 or so years, as lawyers, mostly women lawyers, worked to think through how legal materials could be used toward the end of creating a society in which women have more opportunity for economic self-sufficiency and control over their own destinies. From my very first days as a lawyer representing workers in the labor movement, I was privileged to be part of that effort on occasion. And part of what I want to talk about in my brief remarks today really is, is the handing down of the mantle from other women who did similar work. Because almost as soon as I began working at a small DC law firm that represented several national unions and the AFL-CIO, I was invited out to lunch by a woman who would have been awarded a Margaret Bent Award had she lived long enough, because she died before the award was instituted. Ruth Wyand, who was in all probability the very first woman to represent unions in the Supreme Court, and she represented the National Labor Relations Board in the 1940s in some very key cases. At that time, Ruth was about to brief and argue General Electric Company versus Gilbert which concerned whether pregnant women could, under Title VII, be denied pregnancy discrimination, disability benefits. In the tradition of women mentoring women and conveying a sense of the past, a tradition that I have tried very much to continue with my, younger, my young women colleagues and law clerks, Ruth told me how pleased she was that there was finally a woman representing the AFL-CIO as she had been offered a position many years before, she told me, only to have it revoked before she could start because uh, some higher up was not interested in having a woman representing the labor movement. Another Margaret Brent Award winner, winner Judith Vladek, who died this year, 
was often the only other woman in the room at meetings of union lawyers that I attended in the 1970s and early 1980s. And then there was the meeting right after the adverse Supreme Court decision in the Gilbert case that I mentioned a, a while ago, in which a group of lawyers, almost all women and some of them here today, met to talk over the ideas that later became the Pregnancy Discrimination Act. With Ruth Ginsburg, another Margaret Bent Award winner, of course, there to advise us younger, inexperienced lawyers about the realm of the possible and the realm of the desirable. It was the handing down of the mantle from women like Ruth Wyand and Judith Vladek and Ruth Ginsburg and Barbara Bob Babcock and Herma Kay to my slightly younger generation, a generation of many women lawyers interested in the lives of women as workers that has inspired me throughout my career and that inspires me today. We had the luxury of working together rather than in isolation from the outset. As time went on, the number of women representing labor unions grew as well. The camaraderie of those joint legal efforts forged friendships still strong today. As we talked law and discussed our children, and our frustrations in trying to balance professional and family life and still have time for ourselves. It was largely those groups of women, dear friends like Lois Schiffer, who was at the first post-Gilbert meeting, women union lawyers like Nora Macy, Lynn Reinhardt, and Judy Scott, members of the group of 25 or so women who comprised the annual Bay Area Mother Lawyer Retreat, largely organized every year by Marjorie Gelb, and my wonderful friends in the women's rights legal community, including, including yet another Margaret Brent Award win, winner, Judith Lickman, and the two co-presidents of the National Women's Law Center, Duffy Campbell and Marcia Greenberger, who brought me to the attention of the ABA Commission on Women in the Profession. Having had that history and that camaraderie and that sense of connection over the years, I worry about whether young women lawyers today could find in the law, will find in the law, similar networks of women to share their lives and their interest in improving the lot of women, especially less fortunate women, and about whether today's legal ha atmosphere is hospitable to using the legal system to advance social justice generally and gender equality particularly. I always say that I have amnesia about how my husband Stephen and I managed to raise two terrific children Jeremy and Allie, while working hard on things we cared a great deal about. But the degree I achieved any balance at all, it was largely because my husband and I and Fred Altshuler in 1978 founded and were partners in Altshuler Burzon, in a which was at that time a tiny firm, and as a result we had enormous flexibility to adjust the firm's work to our family responsibilities. And again, I wonder, as Roxy mentioned earlier, about whether the firms and organizations of today are willing to provide that accommodation or are so bottom line oriented that they are not and will not. Finally, on a different note, my parents, Sylvia, now deceased, and Jack, who's here today, are really the ones to be thanked. By the way, I, I did this last because I would have cried if I did it first. They never told me, as so many of my of women of my generation were told that there were limits to what I could do intellectually and professionally. So I never thought there were. And the one truly sad thing today is that my dear brother Arthur is not with us. Now I will cry. He died in January and I miss him terribly. He coped not only with good humor, with a family, not always with good humor, with a family of four strong and assertive women, my sisters Beth and Mary and my mother and me but he was always my biggest personal and professional supporter. So I miss him and I wish you were here. I am proud on behalf not only of myself, but of my family and of the women in my generation and older who have nurtured me over the years to accept the Mark of Brand Award. Thank you. <laughs>